Uh, very good evening and warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine on a slightly cooler, slightly damp Johannesburg afternoon, which still, I think, makes it a lot drier than it is down in the Cape, where rain has thrown a little spanner or two in the harvesting works of many of our winemakers and their teams, including one of our guests this evening. We have a very special celebration of the Cape Winemakers Guild and both the three newest members and the three newest protégés to have joined the program. Unfortunately, one of them is not going to be with us because the rain has meant an emergency harvest of grapes and he's dashed off. The winemaker in question is Renan Borman. We might sneak him in towards the end of the show, uh, but if not, we'll have him back on in the next little while. But he is being joined by his two fellow new graduates to the Cape Winemakers Guild, as well as the three new protégés. And I am going to introduce them to you in just a moment. I'm also in a moment going to tell you about a rather nice lunch we had yesterday where we did some experimentation on the art of food and wine pairing with a style of food that doesn't often sit alongside wine or certainly not terribly comfortably. What was that? We'll find out in just a second. There is also news of bubbles headed the way of Johannesburg. So start preparing your blue and out blue and white outfits for one of Johannesburg's favorite wine celebrations. All that is coming up right now, so let's get a quick look at your latest news. Well, this is happening out at Marathi. Dan Patlansky, I've done a number of events where Dan has played. He's got a real gift as a musician, and on the 11th of March, he will be playing at Marathi in Stellenbosch. You can head over to marathi.ca.za to grab your tickets. Uh, 295 rand or 150 rand for kids under the age of 12, and you'll be listening to some great music, but I suspect you'll also be drinking some rather nice wine and taking the beauty of the Marathi Wine Estate in Stellenbosch. That is with Dan Patlansky on the 11th of March. Now, this is what I was referring to from a rather good meal. This was yesterday. David Higgs, chef superstar, invited us around to a lunch by us. I mean, myself and my wife, but also Vickers, uh, head sommelier at Marble, and his wife, Natalie. Uh, Leon, a uh, Greek wine collector of some renown in Johannesburg. A uh, young guy called Mark, a trainee triathlete. Uh, and it was just a nice group of people who all really enjoy their wine. The challenge was that we all had to bring a few bottles to see what would pair with curry. Because we had a range of curries, lamb, chicken, vegetables, seafood curries that David and his team had put together. And we tried to work out what would pair best. Now, now you'll see all of this in an article in Wine Mag next week or two. Uh, but very quickly, as you flick through from left to right, uh, on the far left, uh, that was some wine from Greece. That was uh, the Bosinakis uh, family vineyard. So you might remember Katerina Bosinakis was on the show when we were in Greece last year making some, some really cool, really fun wine. Uh, and there, that was uh, the uh, the Bosinaki vineyards, um, Malevasia wine, uh, which we really, really enjoyed. And next to it, Tim Rao, the German celebrity chef. Uh, that was his... Uh, relatively newly released Riesling. That went really nicely. Uh, the Mifro Kirsten, don't tell you, but it was only eight years old, not the prescribed 70 years he would prefer. But why none of us got some older French Sauvignon Blanc uh, from uh, Didier, the great French winemaker. Uh, some 2012 Duncan Savage was still there. Cape Point Isle, the Sauvignon Blanc Semillon blend. Uh, some old Harbourdiels Clure for a bit of 2010 Beaumont. Pope Marguerite, uh, and the two at the end, there was some uh, Sardi family uh, Cape Tawny port style wine, and a 2006 Premier Cru Burgundy. Both of those are very nice, uh, but the wine that took it for the day, in everybody's opinion, was the third from the end on the right there. That was from Jordan, the Riesling, uh, 2005 Riesling. This came out of my cellar. I had no idea what condition it was still going to be in. It had been kept carefully, but a 2005 Riesling, almost 20 years on, it had a beautiful depth and richness and rode happily alongside every single one of the curries, which admittedly weren't too hot and added a beautiful dimension 
to every single dish we had. So really, really cool afternoon and a lot of fun taking some food you don't normally pair with wine and coming out with some rather interesting additions. David Higgs, thank you very much for a most memorable Sunday afternoon. And then this is coming up in Johannesburg. It is the Cup Classic and Champagne Festival. It's back at the Ananda Polo Club from 11 until 4 o'clock, 25th and 26th of March at the end of the month. And this is Daryl Robertson, who always does a terrific job in pulling together a really, really cool range of Cup Classics. And that is exactly what she has done again this year. You can see a couple of brands sitting in the picture at the moment. But in terms of some of the other ones that you are going to see uh, if you do get there at the end of the month. Uh, you've got a really, really nice selection of big names, people uh, uh, like Miguel Cove, Black Elephant Vintners, Bon Courage, Graham Beck, uh, Clay Nazalza, Stienberg, Villiera, uh, Paul René, Lomeron, and some of the international brands uh, like Champagne Deutz will be there. Uh, so uh, just a really nice selection. It's all blue and white again, and those tickets are now on sale if you would like uh, to get along. 450 Rand per person, include your entry, your souvenir branded glass and 10 coupons and you buy some more bubbly while you're there, should you so wish. So put that one in the diary, 25 and 26 of March for the Johannesburg Cup Classic and Champagne Festival. And that is with Sunland Private Wealth. Make sure you, <coughs> oh, excuse me, make sure you that should be a really, really good afternoon. All right, well, let's move on to our very special guest then today. As I say, Renan is not with us, but we do have not just two new members of the Cape Winemakers Guild, but I think even more excitingly, our three newest protégés as part of the programme, which the Cape Winemakers Guild with Nedbank has done such a great job in creating a path for. Uh, so let me welcome all five of our guests as they join us from different parts of the Western Cape, uh, respectively dropping in from Storm Vineyards, and from uh, La Riche, and from Hartenberg, and from Duncan Savage, and Kanonkop is all fine. Please say a very warm welcome to two members of the Cape Winemakers Guild, and, <coughs> oh, excuse me, a bit of a throat this week, and our three protégés. Guys, welcome, lovely to have you all on the show, and a very, very warm welcome uh, to Carabello, to Panasso, to Polakele, to Christo and to Hannes. Guys, lovely to have you on the show. And I have to say both thank you and my apologies uh, because I probably couldn't have chosen a worse time to drag you all in to join me on the show given the, the sheer amount of work you're all doing with Harvest. And, and Hannes, I know you might be dashing off any minute uh, to go and do some emergency work on your Harvest. So uh, let's bring you in first of all. And, and start by saying congratulations because getting that nod for the Cape Winemakers Guild was certainly very, very well deserved. But I've got no doubt when you got that phone call or got that email, it must be giving you a real spring in the step that, that you were joining the, the elite club of South African winemakers. Yeah, Dan, it was, um, it was really cool to be included and uh, obviously very excited uh, to uh, form part of the special group of, of winemakers and to share knowledge and to learn some, some great stuff and to compare what we do to the rest of the world, essentially. So, and, and then also be be part of a bigger holistic view and um, and and everything all the positive spin-offs off of the guild so i'm very exciting excited to to join the group and uh, yeah it's, uh, it's 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 going to be a great journey ahead um, and i think one can really really um, feel the energy and in, 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 from from the rest of the members and and the programs that are being um, put together for us it's certainly not the first time we've celebrated the Cape Winemakers Guild on the show, but there might be people who are hearing about it for the first time or just don't know a huge amount. Uh, what does it mean, first of all, to be a member of the Guild? What do you have to do? Do you have to learn secret handshakes and uh, get a special uniform together? Well, what are the implications for you personally? Um, Dan, I think um, obviously one must have a, have a fantastic track record. I think it's at least almost 10 years and um yeah and i think it's just a question of um of focusing on the ball and try to make uh, exceptional wines and i think uh, um it was always been um be, been when it was introduced to make some 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 really special wines that are comparable to to some of the best wines and it's really for me a, a great privilege to be part of that and 
I think we, as a learning curve, we can all just get better by by cross pollinating um, from 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 members and programs what we do, and then uh, to 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 compare that to the rest of the world. Yeah, so it's a it's, it's a big excitement for me um, to to be able to 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 get in there. Yeah, it was just focusing on the ball and, and making some 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 decent wines, I think. So that's so that's the individual part. You do form a greater collective, and it's that collective that has such an impact, Hannes. By extension, tell us a little bit about the Cape Winemakers Guild as a whole, why we have it, and and what good work you guys are continuing to do. Yeah, I think I think it's a, a few important aspects to mention. And firstly, is, is that auction part um, that uh, that started in the first auction was in 1985. Um, to promote and to make wines available to the public and wine enthusiasts um, and to compare those wines and um, it's small quantities but uh, to, to have that uh, 30 to 60 cases is quite special um, it's very scarce and uh, it's just a very very good good to, to push the envelope and make get, get some 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 scarcity out there and and, and make wines that 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 can be collected and um, cannot be obtained all over the all over the world and, and at every, any, any place. And then secondly, for me, uh, really important is that Protégé program um, to, to raise funds for, for, the, for the program by, uh, via auction. And then, um, and then the development trust, um, that is just basically to do all the extra, the extra internships, um, uh, all, that, uh, all that bursaries available and, uh, and so forth. So I think it's, 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 really, a, it's really a holistic view of, of just uplifting the whole South African wine industry and uh, and that's basically from A to Z. So it's a it's a really good a good program to be part of, and uh, again very exciting excited to to be part of it. Well, you mentioned the protege program, so let's meet the first of our three proteges who's with us on the show this evening. Uh, Tola Kelly, welcome to the show, and lovely to have you on board. You're in a really exciting position, not just joining the protege program, but working alongside the great Duncan Savage as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, getting the Nord up, uh, finding out about this program, and then discovering that you had been chosen to be part of it. Um, hello, Dan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I studied at the University of Stellenbosch, and the first time I heard about the program, um, Marta came to Stellenbosch and she kind of explained what the program was about. At first, I didn't really understand what the program was about, so I wasn't really like interested because three years was like a lot of, you know, commitment and stuff like that. But then my friend, Leticia Mosima, she's in the program, she's doing her second year now. She um, joined the program and that's where I kind of understood what the program is about. And that's when I got excited and then I just decided to, um, to join, to apply for the program. And then we went for an interview after applying and then um, the interview went quite well. I was nervous, but everything went well. And then, yeah, I got the email that um, the interview was successful and I'll be a protege the following year. It was very exciting for me because um, the CWG protege program is amazing, especially if like you starting and you are not sure of, you know, how to go on about reaching your goal as like a young winemaker. So it was nice having, like knowing that you have people to mentor you and stuff like that. So. I think you've, you've almost answered part of my next question, but I'll, I'll ask it nonetheless. And that is the opportunity that it gives you uh, over these three years. What, from your perspective, is the potential uh, during these three years to take students who's come out of university and in three years' time become somebody completely different within the wine industry? What, what, what is that for you? I'm sorry, can you um, repeat the question? No problem. Well, well, explain to us what you feel the opportunity is for you over the next three years to build on the studying you've already done at Stellenbosch. Yeah. So I think for me, um, being a protege means a lot to me because you get to be mentored by like the best winemakers in the game and like who are like passionate to to teach and mentor. It's not like working like three months at a winery and then 
you know, being at home the rest of the year. You get to be mentored and they help you in so many ways. They help you in your career. They help you understand your personality. Like there's a lot of, they're very involved in your personal growth as well, not just, not just your career as a winemaker. So for me, it means a lot. I feel more secured in the um, wine industry because I don't think it's a easy industry to, to be in you really need to network and stuff like that. So the program allows you to do that and like the opportunities come to you. So the decision is now left with you. You don't have to really like look out for like events and stuff like that. You are always invited and the opportunities are just given to you. So it makes the whole process easy. You've got the opportunity to work with Duncan Savage. You've also got the opportunity to work with Banana, uh, who's great fun and incredibly good at my maker himself. What's that been like so far? Um, it's been amazing. It's been so amazing. Um, Duncan is very passionate. Banana as well, he's very passionate. And they're always willing to like explain and teach and they're patient, but they also like a bit, you know, uh, strict. And I just love how how much of perfectionists they are. Um, it really just shows how passionate they are about, you know, their their job and also how how much they don't play about their craft. So I I always feel so blessed to like work with them. They make me want to become a winemaker. They make the whole process super exciting, and I feel like. Each and every day, my passion for, you know, making wine increases because of them. So it looks like you're definitely in the right space and having a lot of fun. Uh, what about you, Panasa? Would you echo those sentiments? Is that is that passion, that excitement as you settle in for a year on the Carl Schultz at Hartenberg, uh, bubbling over? Are you finding your feet and, uh, and really happy with the space that you've discovered? Well, I think we're just struggling with Panasa's connection there at the moment. So we'll come back to her in just a second. Uh, let's head over then to our, uh, our second new member uh, this evening of the Cape Winemakers Guild, uh, Mr. Larisha Christo. Welcome to what was probably a date with destiny, really, uh, as uh, you, uh, you follow in the footsteps of your father, who's such a, an integral part of the history and the fabric of South African wine. Uh, obviously a great honor and really exciting, but uh, uh, does it feel like now you've uh, you've kind of really joined the family story and uh, uh, and followed on in your dad's footsteps there? Um, yeah, yes and no. It's it's kind of, that's always a tough one in the industry. Um, I'm, I've always been kind of in my dad's shadow going growing up um, and being in the industry itself. But I do think that um, getting getting the invites onto the guild, but also um, getting the the nod from the other the other members was was a big was for me quite a big one. Where it's it's not about what my dad's done, um, but much more about what I've been able to achieve through my my career so far. Um, and I think it's it it has been a while for, before I got on since my I mean my dad is also has also retired in 2016 or 17 from the guild already. Um, so just having that knowledge that it's, I'm not on here already because of what he did, but um, with a, the, the performance of my own wines um, is, is, was something that, that, was, that I have taken and has been important to me. Um, but I'm very excited to be, be part of the Guild. Um, it's, it's people I've been looking up to my entire career. Um, and to see also the, the younger faces on the Guild from the one I knew under when, when my dad was still part of it, um, there's been significant change, and it's 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 great to see. And it's I'm really looking forward to to working with with uh, with all the winemakers who are on there at the moment, and learning from them, and seeing um, and just sharing knowledge and, and and helping to build our industry um, through through as as a as a as a collective. And uh, you, you make a very important part in that this is entirely on your own terms. As much as the rest of the guild adored your dad and respect everything he did, uh, your status as a winemaker has been very firmly established 
on your own terms. Uh, and that's how you find yourself now in this space. But probably where your understanding of this space uh, will have been enhanced is, is from your dad, from the amount of time you've had knowing what this guild is about and therefore realizing not just how cool it is to be part of the gang, uh, but also how much good work the guild is doing and which by extension you're now able to contribute to. No, definitely. So it's, I mean, being able to, to be, be, be part of something that I know my father was one of the founders of um, is, is amazing. Um, but also just looking, looking back over the people who have, I've had the, the honor of being involved with, whether it's um, Kevin Arnold, um, Jan Bullant, um, Bayer Struter, um, the, and then my, most of my internships was, was with guild members under Carl Schultz. David Finlayson, um, Peter Finlayson, um, as well as Giles Webb when he was still on the Guild. So they, they were great mentors to me as well. Um, so I, I think there's, I've, I've got a full understanding of, of the, um, what's the word, the weight and the pressure that comes along with being a Guild member. And there, there is a responsibility towards um, being one of those leaders in the industry. And I hope I can, can, stand, can, can fulfill those shoes. But yeah, the, the Guild has been amazing over what it's done over the years to see how it's the, developed from the independent Cape Winemakers Guild um, and then transforming into what it is today with such a big um, development focus um, and, and the protégé program. So we've, I've had the honor of working with three protégés who, who came into the cellar with my dad still, and those were just amazing guys to have in the cellar and to work with. So I'm really looking forward to being part of, of the, um, the protégé program, having a few of the young guys coming through my cellar as well and being able to just help them find their feet in the industry so um yeah the guild's an amazing space um, and it's been built up over many years of hard work and consistent work from guys who are are truly experts in their craft i must ask you about our third new member who's not with us this evening you you're a pretty rock star trio joining the guild this year we've heard briefly uh, from hannes as he has been dragged away to go and do some emergency harvesting uh give us your perspective if you will christo on renan and why he is also such a fantastic and deserving addition to the guild well i mean renan renan has also gone and really established established himself in our industry over the last six or seven years the epilogue shiraz is is if you look at the platter results over the last period in Tamatka, and he's probably in in my opinion he's one of the top shiraz in the country i think even and and the mullen news might say something different but i love renan's wines um and he's following also in his dad's footsteps who was a long-time guild member in um jacques when he still started out with lamotte um through he was one of the first um you can call it revolutionaries in our industry through the 80s as well um, and just he's got some amazing stories behind him so seeing Redden step into his dad's shoes as well um, and then launching the Patats brand that he does this, and with Sons of Sugarland as well and seeing how he does two different styles of Shirazes some really good Shenans um, and on top of that he's just an amazing guy who loves Stellenbosch he loves his craft and what he does um, and he, he focuses on a smaller scale, but, but just amazing quality wines that he does. So I'm looking forward to working with Renan. He's a, he's a good friend of mine as well. Um, and he's, uh, he's really creative and just a really fun guy to work with as well. Some of you might have seen him on the golf course as well, which is uh, one of his great passions. <laughs> well, we're going to have Renan on the show in the next few weeks to make up for missing him this evening. Uh, I want to come back to you in a moment to ask a little bit more about the Protégé program and the opportunity that our new trio have. Uh, before we did, I see Hannah Storm has had to uh, slip away. I think we're still struggling just a little bit with Panasso. I'm just uh, checking a message from my team. Yep, so let's uh, let's try Carabella then and see how her connection looking. Carabella, welcome to the show. Lovely to have you with us. Congratulations on uh, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, how exciting was it for you when you found out uh, that you'd got in and you were part of this tremendous three-year program? I have to say I was very, very anxious. But before that, thank you so much for having me, Dad. Um, I think that told us we'd find out in a week. And then a week went by, and then another week went by. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't make it. And I was like, gosh, this is something that was part of my plan. And I might have to alter that plan. Um, and then Monday morning, um, you know, I got an email and I was like, whoa. Literally started crying, called my mom and celebrated. 
so then I found out I was at Kanon Corp which was even better and I was just like okay everything's coming together the plan is there so it, it really is even now I'm quite anxious it's so unbelievable but I'm very happy that I've made it and I'm here and you're in a space that you're really geared up for. Uh, I think you grew up in Bredasdorp, if I'm not mistaken. You got your degree in agriculture and in cellar technology, and you're you're in a space where you've got a bit of a background. So when you knew not only you were getting this opportunity, but also the opportunity to kick it off at Kononkov with somebody like Arbery, who's got such extraordinary experience, just that that sense of what this opportunity was for you must have been enormous. You know, it definitely was. It really, really was. I mean, you know, that's exactly what the Guild is all about. Um, putting you in places and with people like Aubrey who will really groom you to be the best of the best. And that is the goal, essentially. So being part of the Cape Winemakers Guild really just sets you to um, aim and strive for greatness. So, yeah, it's quite <laughs> exciting. We heard a moment ago from Christo talking about the, the influence of his dad, by extension, Renan talking about his dad. They've seen previous Guild members come and go and inspire them. Uh, what about your inspiration, your role models in the wine industry? Who are the people, Carabello, who've said to you, yep, yeah, this, this is an industry I'd like to be in. These are the kind of people I would like to emulate. Um, coming from Alsenburg and being mentored by Lorraine Chaldonet, we really are exposed to a lot of people within the industry and when we go out to these visits you really tend to realize and see that the wine industry is like this a big family and seeing that and having these people know that they can call you or you can call them at any moment really just pushed me further into this um, industry and you know if i had to name a couple of people johan Lund, from Simon Sophie always has had an open door policy with the students. And, you know, when we get to make our own wine at Alsenberg, you get to call anyone in the industry and the help is tremendous. So every single person in the industry has really played a role with me being here right now. And, you know, and I'd like to mention her again, Lorraine Caldenet. I mean, I had no, um, background of winemaking at all and she just grew that passion within me and now i'm here so and i'm quite happy so it's really just every bit and every person that just grew this big thing and yeah it's clearly been a, a fantastic journey for you and it's one that is only just beginning over the course of the three years and uh, just give us an idea uh, if you will carabella what what it actually means day to day to be a protege. What are you actually doing? How involved are you? Uh, are you really rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands stuck in? Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Dan, as I'm sitting right now, I'm surviving off two hours of sleep. <laughs> um, we really do get into it. Um, and I'd have to say passion really plays a huge role. Being a protege, isn't only just about being in the cellar and being a winemaker and having your own winery one day and you know it's really a lot comes to play to it you really need to be within it you need to love what you do and we actually have the people who um, support us with development programs skills programs and you know there's personality tests and that's essentially what a protege is about it's the winemaking, you as a person, who do you want to be, what do you want to do, and you get your hands dirty, you survive with two hours of sleep, and you know, you carry on your harvest, and you wake up the next day and you do it again, because you know, you love what you do, and that's essentially what it's about, and just striving to learn more every single day, and that's the lovely thing about the wine industry, you know, it's not the same thing every day, you learn something different.
Uh, I think we just lost Carabello at the end there, but we got the gist of it, including uh, the uh, the reality. Winemaking sounds pretty cool and glamorous, doesn't it? It is a lot of hard work. Uh, it's also been a little bit of work managing to find a connection, but she's done it for us. So uh, Panasso is now with us. And uh, welcome back uh, properly this time, Panasso. Lovely to have you on the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey to deciding that trying to get into the Protégé program was something you wanted to do, and then finding out that you'd actually made it. Um, actually, it wasn't my plan, like being part of the wine industry, being a winemaker, but I honestly feel like it's a career that chose me as a person and I love every bit of it. So what caused me to apply for the procedure program was that it's very difficult finding a job by yourself. Um, um, when you're still in the university, so I had gone to a lot of interviews trying to find um, a good job for harvest for like three months it's just tough um, I didn't have transport I didn't have accommodation so it was just like impractical uh, for me to like get a job um, during harvest as we work late hours so the procedure program I, I knew about it when Magda came to school as Tolagele said and she explained everything um to us and luckily enough i did my first harvest there was a protege that was mentored by carl that's mentoring me this year so i kind of had an idea of what happens the relationship that that protege had with carl it inspired me a lot and i wanted that experience again and luckily enough i got located in the very same uh, winery, way, winery way i got to experience um what happens in the protege's life so yeah it was an interview i got um, an email telling me that i got in and that was that so i was excited and happy to finally get a job <laughs> <laughs> and you've now certainly got a job because at harvest time is when you really learn just how much work you have to do what what have the big learnings been what's surprised you what has uh, taken you aback what have you really discovered in the short time you've been a protege so far um as i said i did my harvest last year here in the same winery that i'm in right now so i thought it was just gonna be a walk in the park because it's something that i've been exposed to um to my surprise i have new responsibilities now because the people my colleagues trust me i've been here before so it feels new it feels it's very tiring you work a lot but luckily enough for heart and back a lot of things are automated so we don't get two hours of sleep i get eight hours um but yeah it, it's it, as much as you get enough hours of sleep as much as everything is automated it's still draining because you have to do like a lot of calculations you work um yeah it's just you i do a, a, min, a, a maximum a minimum of eleven thousand steps a day so that's just so intense but i love every bit of it uh, what you can't see watching this is the internal conversation between the different guests uh, where Carabello is sending devil signs and horns at her colleague for eight hours of sleep while she survives on just two, the joys of making wine. Uh, and uh, it, it really is a joy, though, and it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, if we jump back to you, Krista, for a second, uh, you've seen protégés come through. It's a space you know particularly well. But what's your advice to our three young protégés in terms of seizing this opportunity and making the most of it? Uh, I think it's it's basically what Carabello said. The wine industry is one big family, and uh, being introduced into the family and having somebody to to take you to the events and introduce you to the different people who are involved is probably one of the most valuable things that 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 the Protege program can do for you. So you're obviously learning from from great winemakers in individual wineries, but every winery is different, and every winemaker has got a different approach. And somewhere in that, you've got to kind of figure out what do you love, what is the space of the wine trade that you want to be working or focusing in, whether it's it's within a style of winemaking, whether it's a philosophy, whether you like the the challenge of working in a large scale winery where you're doing a multitude of products or focusing into something small and more craft like. Um, 
being able to meet all these different winemakers that are in all shapes of within within the the, the industry who are on the guild um, just really gives you and opens up doors and it's it's a it's an internship which I think there's there's nothing like it in South Africa and I don't think really in the world there's much uh, uh, such an kind of opportunity where young winemakers can really go in for three years they just get get to to chat and and meet and interact with the best guys in the country so yeah it's the it's best is just soak up and have those conversations in the awkward periods of time um and never never stand in a corner uh, when you're at a wine function but walk up and chat to the guys because i think the more one realizes how what a fun industry this is to be in and and just how much how what what nice people they really are involved in i hate the word nice but it's it kind of uh it does encompass a lot of what's what's involved there's there's really people of all shapes and sizes and philosophies and approaches, and you can find your space and, and what makes you happy around it within the wine trade. That's why I'm back in the wine trade. It's not for the money, it's for the passion, um, fortunately and unfortunately. You're, uh, you're spot on in terms of the nature of the people in the wine industry. It's really tough to find somebody you won't get on with in the broader community. And these are people who are going to provide that education. I think by extension, you've got three young winemakers here, Krista, who've had education. They've learned a lot. They've been in the classroom. They've been in harvests already. But these three years now, it's just education at another level. It's your, your honours and your doctorates and your masters all thrown into one over three years. No, no, for sure. And it's, it, it's, it's one of those spaces where you can go and get a master's or a doctorate in winemaking, but the, the craft of wine is, is such a broad field that if, if you have a doctor's degree in winemaking, it's, you've, you specialize in such a specific focus within our industry that you end up missing out on what being an actual winemaker is all about, where you're busy with marketing, you're busy with viticulture you're busy with winemaking you learn engineering when you try and figure out how to take your winery off the grid um, which is becoming a specialization of a lot of winemakers at the moment um, so being able to just work with all these different um, influences it it really does give you a much broader platform of knowledge and walking out of a three-year internship like this where uh, they where they it's not just about training in terms of of the wine craft, but also doing Toastmasters, learning how to stand up in front of a crowd and talk, um, learning how to manage your finances, um, getting driver's licenses. Um, it's, it's some of the, the, the basics of, of that you need as, as just as, as, as with people in terms of people skills um, and just personal development that, that's kind of fast tracked, which, which is also a great way so that when you walk out of here, you're not just a great winemaker, but you're able to translate that into a into a public face and persona that can be used and and by the different wineries. Because in the end, if you're a winemaker, you've got to stand up in front of people and 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 be be the face of a winery in many uh, occasions. And I think that's something one often, as a student, doesn't quite realize that that makes up a major portion of what what being a winemaker is all about. It is a very broad education. Tolakele, your education is a little different in some ways, given the nature of the Duncan Savage setup, little parcels of grapes dotted all over the Western Cape that are fetched and bought in to make wine in the heart of downtown Salt River. Uh, how different, how cool has that been to operate in this urban winery space? Let's see, we might just have, uh, oh, we've lost Tolokola there for a second. All right, uh, well, let's uh, go back then to uh, uh, to Panasso. Panasso, uh, when you look at the role that you had, yes, it's uh, certainly an opportunity for you and to uh, become this great winemaker, a future Cape Winemakers Guild member, perhaps. Uh, what about the role of you as a, a role model for other young black women in South Africa? Because this is an industry where black women have not been prominent in the past. It is starting to change slowly, but it's starting to change. You're now part of that change. How important is that to you? Um, I, I get this question a lot. Um, and every time I just say passion is the answer. And also, if you 
decide to be the best and do the best for you, you automatically motivate other people to look up to you. So I feel like for me, it is never about the people. It is never about who's looking at me, who's doing what. I just focus on me being the best. I'm learning from the best and doing the best. And then let the work speak for itself. It's true, not a lot of um, black women are in the industry, but there's some who've been before us, like Ndigi Biela um, and the white Mekai Delham. So it's like a, a train of you looking up to someone and making things better and taking what's best from them and then passing on to the next. So yeah, I feel like that's that, yeah. You've got this opportunity now uh, that has kicked off and uh, and you're clearly very, very focused on what you're going to do. Uh, and you're going to be looking in the not too distant future at particular wines. And uh, if I understand correctly, uh, of all the ones you'll probably be making, it'll be Cap, uh, Cap Classique that's probably top of the list for coming out first. I'm quite not sure yet since I'm just a first year pro the day. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking into that. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's probably it's probably one of the one of the challenges uh, that you get um, when you uh, when you start off like this is that you've got so much uh, so much opportunity so much new experience that comes through uh, that, you know perhaps when you arrive you think right this is what I'd like to do but in a, a matter of just weeks and uh, and months you start discovering there is so much else you can do and it it, it opens your eyes at a huge amount has, has that been the case for you has the, the learning curve been quite steep of all sorts of new doors and windows been opened in terms of your understanding the the potential of you as a winemaker yeah definitely definitely um because i started the program with the thing of just saying i like uh red wine and red wine is the most difficult wine to make but this year i just discovered that white wine is actually as difficult as well because you have to press on time it takes a lot of time processing um, white grapes than red than red grapes. So it's definitely a learning opportunity for us. And you get to ask questions to the mentors after work. They explain everything to you, which shifts your focus and challenges your level of thinking. Um, and the most important thing to keep yourself learning throughout this whole uh, process and time is to ask why all the time. So that's why I, that's what I try to do. I ask why we do this, why, why, until I get the answer <laughs> that I feel like it's okay for me. Uh, it's such a great philosophy to have for us. And I love that it kicks in. It speaks to exactly what Christo was just saying about exactly the right approach. Uh, Caramel, what, what about your approach? You're out at this uh, estate in Canaan Cop that's steeped in history. It's got 100 point wines. It's got this uh, incredible heritage of making Pinotage. Uh, what in terms of your understanding of wine and, and what's possible for you as Carabello, the winemaker, has opened up for you in the short time that you've been there so far? You know, um, Dan, I, like I said earlier, I was quite happy when I found that I'd be at Kanon Gok because it speaks to what I want in the future. And that's also creating my own little heritage and being like the first generation winemaker for my family and having these traditions. So starting off at a place like Kanon Gok really then sort of like plants the seeds and you know puts in the roots for what i plan to do and it's like sort of like a guiding and it's this journey that i've now started and it's it speaks like i said it speaks towards now what i would like to do in my philosophy creating a very family traditional um sort of environment and wine farm one day god willing so yeah i'm really it's great to know that this is where my seeds have been planted and the work that I'll put in is the watering and it will eventually grow into something I hope as big as Ganon Kop. It's a journey that has many, many more chapters to be told uh, with a strong focus on wine, but, but not exclusively Carabella, because am I right to think that there is also an element of fashion that could come into play in, in your work in the wine industry? 
Yes, definitely. So when you were speaking to Panasana about black women, in terms of fashion, I was thinking women in general. And lately there's been this trend called women and wine. And as we see now, the wine industry is really, the women are really joining the industry and we are really saturating it. And I always felt like, we weren't really catered for. And if we're going to be fully saturating this industry, we need to really feel like we are part of the industry. And being a model in my past and now being in farming, I feel like putting those two together and creating a clothing brand for women in the industry to also, you know, fit in in that sense and be comfortable at work and, you know, sort of put everything together, um, that's where the fashion would come in. It wouldn't be fashionable clothes, but it would be workable clothes <laughs> for women in the wine industry. And, and, and I think that talks of a space where, yeah, not that long ago, uh, black women were not seen a huge amount of. That, as I said earlier, is changing at a pace that can certainly increase. Uh, but to do so, it's got to be a space where everybody does feel more comfortable and more natural. And I get the sense that that is part of your broader vision, that you're creating somewhere where, whether it is the look and feel, uh, or just you know that the people around you are welcoming and friendly, uh, that it's no longer a sense of, I don't really know if I feel comfortable here. I don't really know if this space is for me. That is changing. And, and I sense that part of your philosophy is to speed up that pace of change and doing so in a couple of different ways. You know, definitely 100% Dan. Um, you know, the industry is growing. Um, you know, you have these projects called the Gen Z project. And, you know, essentially what you want to do is to ensure that everyone's comfortable because we're all here to do the same thing. We're here to really lift up South Africa's wine industry, really trying to grow it. And in order to do so, we all need to be on the same page and being able to create that environment and that space for comfortability. And I mean, if you're comfortable, you're happy. That's like, I really like saying that if you look good, you feel good. If you feel good, you do good. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do, um, just to really add growth and developments within the industry also in different segments. I'm going to come back to you and your colleagues in a second uh, because I want to find out where you think you're going to be in 10 years time. So start giving that question some thought, but let's talk a little wine with Christo before we wrap up the show. Uh, and I've had a glass of the 2019 Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, I have to tell you, Christo, I, I made a terrible mistake. We make bad life decisions sometimes. I'm pretty good at making those. I opened a bottle of your 2011 Reserve Cab a few weeks ago, and I opened it with other people, which meant that I had to share it, which was a disastrous decision because it is comfortably the best red wine I've had so far this year. It was just in such an utterly glorious space. Uh, you can imagine Marie Antoinette bathing in the stuff. That's kind <laughs> of where it was. Uh, and it's not really surprising because the legacy of Cabernet Sauvignon from your dad through to yourself now uh, is exactly what Larisha has celebrated for so long. 19 is looking like a really, really cool vintage as well. Uh, tell us a bit about this love affair with Cabernet Sauvignon and what has allowed both the Lariche family and the Lariche terroir to come together quite so beautifully. Thanks, Dan. Those were quite, um, quite uh, flattering words that you had there. Um, no, the... I think Cabernet's, Cabernet's come with us for a long period of time. I mean, we've... My dad... Uh, my family really have, have come down from, from the Kalahari. So we don't have a, a winemaking background other than what when my father studied here at Stellenbosch. And it's, it was there where he first, first fell in love with, with the wine trade and, and, and everything about the wine industry and the culture that goes alongside with it. And I think he, he was, when he was, uh, I think it was in 75, he was still the winemaker at... Um, uh, at Nitra Bay, the experimental winemaker, and he went uh, to go and clear out the frogs in, uh, in the irrigation dam on Rustenburg Estate because at that stage he was an avid spear fisherman and he had some scuba gear and he was able to go down and clean out the sieves because all the fogs, frogs get sucked onto the sieve and block up the irrigation dams. 
and he ended up getting his uh, his um, his assistant winemaker offer from from uh, from the then um, it was still Reg Nicholson and and Peter Barlow were still the owners at that stage, and he was lucky enough to walk in onto Rustenburg Estate, which is is really one of the in, on the heart of the Simonsburg, one of the most um, the bastions of of the of Cabernet Sauvignon in in Stellenbosch and in South Africa, um, and that that really kicked off his love affair with with Cabernets. He ended up traveling through Bordeaux, um, and then I mean my birth year was was eighty four, which was a great year for my dad. My sister's birth year was eighty two, uh, which was arguably to be one of the best vintages he ever did. So we we were raised and suckled on on great uh, Rustenburg cabs. Um, so when he went on his own. And, and started out the rish, it was, it was a no-brainer for him to work with Cabernets. Um, but he had the luxury of being able to select the best from what's out in Stellenbosch. And today, that's still the same philosophy that we keep. Um, we're still working with vineyards from right around Stellenbosch. So we, we're picking on the Simonsburg, Jonkershoek. Um, I've still got blocks out in, uh, on, on the Botteray at the moment. Uh, we're up on the Helderberg, um, on the lower slopes, more to, to the Helderberg coastal region. Um, so really working with Cabernets from all around Stellenbosch, and I was fortunate enough to grow up in Stellenbosch. It's my small town, um, and it's for I've, I strongly feel, and my dad strongly felt this as well, that the best way to express Stellenbosch terroir is 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 through cabs. We've got this diversity of mountains that we can work off, ocean influences, um, wind pockets, soils. And if you bring all of those things together in one cultivar, you get this diversity of flavor profiles that we can blend together. And that's really where, where my love affair started um, from a young age. And it's, it's something that uh, I like this town. It's not a bad space to live in uh, within a, in, a, in a South African context. Um, and then we make some great wines here as well. So it's, it's definitely a good, a good space to be hanging out on a day-to-day -day basis. So a pretty, uh, a pretty steady bet then when the Cape Winemakers Guild auction comes around that uh, your maiden vintage as a guild member will be a cab sub? I think uh, if I release a Shiraz out of the Larish stall, I think my family might just kind of kick fire me from, my, from the business and I'll have to go and find another job somewhere else. Um, so yeah, you can probably bet on it that it'll be a Cabernet coming, out of, come, coming from us. Um, I might see, I might blend in something else at some stage. Um, the, the, the guild is all about being experimental and, and, and seeing, and seeing what, what the boundaries are out there. And as, as time develops, we'll have to see, um, what, what, what comes, comes to mind where, where I feel the next boundaries are that needs to be pushed, but it'll always be with the Cabernet context. Um, and with that Cabernet hat on that, that I'll probably be thinking. Friday 6, Saturday 7, October, that is the Gabe Winemakers Guild with Ned Bank later on this year at the Lord Charles Hotel in uh, Somerset West, where there will be some new wine out. There'll also be the chance uh, to try some wine from the Protégés, because the Protégés also get to make a, a small amount of some quite exciting wine. I've had a number of them over the years, and it's always been a delight to see where these young wine careers are going. Uh, so uh, let's uh, jump over to see where... Uh, we might be headed. Uh, we did want to chat to Panas, so I think we've just lost us. Let's head over to, to Carabello. At 10 years' time, you're on Dan Really Likes Wine with Norman Goodfellows, and we are talking about your wine career. Where has the wine career got to? What have you done? What are we celebrating, Carabello? In 10 years, then, um, I see myself as one of the best winemakers our country has seen. And I say this mainly because of where I am right now and where I am going for the next three years. These are the stepping stones that will put me there in 10 years time. So yeah, one of the best winemakers, hopefully with my own little farm going somewhere and a lot of international exposure. I mean, to be one of the best, you really need to taste a lot so that you can really we can like distinguish more or less where you want to be so then in 10 years time i hope to see you um in one of my tasting rooms on my farm enjoying i'm not sure yet maybe a glass of bubbly maybe a good pinotage a cap sap shiraz or maybe even a shin and blank but that's it for me definitely 
Uh, and I'm putting it in a diary 10 years from now to uh, hold you to that. And I, I love the sense of ambition and I love the very clear and precise focus on where you want to go and, and how you're going to get there. So uh, with that uh, Cape Winemakers Guild behind you, uh, I think it's a journey that is headed very family and at some speed in the right direction. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost uh, our other two guests, uh, uh, Panasso and the Tolokele, uh, not with us. It is harvest. It's really, really busy. So uh, I will uh, leave then with uh, with my final two and uh, to uh, Carabella and to Christo. Uh, guys, thank you uh, to both of you for being on the show this evening, uh, for highlighting uh, what the Guild is, why it is so important and the work that has been done. Uh, Christo, again, congratulations on being part of the new team and a, a really nice extension to this family story. And uh, I think, Christo, it might not be 10 years' time, but I don't think it'll be too much more after that uh, when we're on a show. And there's a, a young winemaker called Carabello uh, who's being admitted to the Cape Winemakers Guild as well uh, to uh, take this story to its, uh, to its next level. So, guys, both of you, thank you very much. Good luck with the rest of Harvest. Apologies again for thank dragging you. away. Uh, Carabello, I hope you get more than two hours sleep tonight. <laughs> and, uh, look, see both of you in person soon uh, for some wonderful wine. And... Uh, Good luck with your respective Cape Winemakers Guild journeys. Thanks, Thank Anne. You. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, Ben. So there we go. Carabello's out at Canon Corp Cristo, who is, of course, Larish, new member, along with Hannah Storm and Rinan Borman of the Cape Winemakers Guild, and Carabello working with Arbery Bisla at Canon Corp. What a space to be able to learn in, to grow in, and to develop in as a young winemaker. We've seen the protégés over the years uh, rise to the fore in the wine industry, and all three of our guests set to take advantage of that opportunity as well. It's a wonderfully uplifting and inspiring story in the South African wine community, and one I delight in sharing as often as possible, the Cape Winemakers Guild with Medbank doing a fabulous job. That wraps us up for this particular evening. Uh, we've got some really nice wine sitting on the new Dan Really Likes Wine Digital pop-up store with Norman Goodfellows. So do head over and have a look. Some uh, big magnums, uh, big I mean in style, from Plazier and from Bartony. Uh, there's a really cool collection from Spider Pig, uh, a mini vertical of the signature from Ernie Els going back 13, 14, and 15. Uh, some really nice wine from Ian Nodir as well, plus some Botmoscop from Delegraph. And remember, any bottle of Botmoscop, any bottle of Delegraph that you buy from Norman Goodfellows this month into a draw, away you go, and you could be spending two nights at Delegraph, flights included if you don't live in the Cape, for a really, really special wine adventure. Uh, thank you to a couple of our guests uh, who I see uh, jumped on. Uh, we had uh, uh, Manz Mangueni, congratulations. Thanks, Manz, that definitely enjoyed De Caledi Pizzo. Uh, I think we know what De Caledi is doing this evening. The wine glass has been filled. And Grant Saul's, the Lariche Reserve 2015, is fantastic. I think all those Lariche Reserves are just a joy. All right, we'll see you back again on Thursday. When Christian Eads joins us with a selection of top South African producers, it is Wine Mag's 10-year report with Prescient, where you find out who has finished top of the lot in terms of the judges' thoughts for 10-year-old wine going back to 2013. That's coming up on Thursday on Dan Really Likes Wine with Norman Goodfellows. So have a great evening. Good luck to all our winemakers harvesting away, especially with a bit of rain around. We'll see you back on Thursday. Goodbye. <laughs>